Okay, so good morning, everyone. How are you today? <laughs> I hope that you had a pleasant session so far. And in the next 45 minutes, I want to discuss about something that I really like, but something that is very abstracted, some kind of concept. I will discuss about microservices, of course. That's kind of the title of the conference, so I'm kind of forced to discuss about microservices anyway. But I want to talk about data, and I want to focus, actually, on data first, because manipulating data and data set within a microservices architectures has actually many challenges. It's not as easy as in the monolith architectures. But before starting, let me quickly introduce myself. So this is me. Well, to be accurate, this was me maybe 10 years ago. I need to change my pictures, but I don't have good pictures of me. It's, it's kind of a big issue. And I am an engineer at Confluent, and just by curiosity, who heard of Confluent before? If you know Confluent, just raise your hand. Oh, fuck, a lot of people, actually. I'm quite surprised. But maybe you know Confluent because we are one of the sponsors. Maybe you have seen us. That's why, I think. Uh, and who heard of Apache Kafka? I, I guess most, yes, everyone. Yes, that's kind of expected. So if you don't know it, Confluent is basically the company behind Apache Kafka. So we develop, support, do tra new training, do develop the ecosystem around Apache Kafka. We are really the company behind Apache Kafka. And to be accurate, I am what we call a solution architect at Confluent, meaning that I spend my time developing, but I also spend my time with customers trying to assist them on their Apache Kafka project. So I spend most of my time you know, on site with companies and trying to help them in their microservices or in their Apache Kafka project. But before working at Confluent, before working in this kind of environment, I was actually a database expert. And I really come from this background of manipulating data and data manipulations. So I've been working at company like uh, MongoDB and some other big red companies that I don't want to pronounce the name nowadays because it's not very popular. Uh, and if you want to know me, just know that I got some very cute and smoothly hair. I'm very proud of my hair, so I kind of liked it. And I, I'm kind of jealous because I've seen that in this conference, some people got some very nice hair exactly like me. So I'm very jealous. So today, I want to discuss and I will discuss about microservices. And what's really microservices about? Let's try to discuss about that. What's, what are we trying to do with microservices? Well, for most people, microservices is actually all about splitting some monoliths. Because most company, when they started their new project, when they bootstrap their new company, most people start with a monolith applications. And this made sense. And this could still make sense nowadays, because it's quite natural and quite intuitive to go for the simplest and fastest way to develop applications. When you have a small team, when you've got aggressive time to market, monolith applications make sense. But as your company grows, as you need to scale, a monolith architecture could have many challenges. Like, it's pretty hard to scale a monolith applications. And at that time, most people decide to split some monoliths and go for some kind of microservices architectures where they will have many processes, many code base, and many independent team working all together. So most of the time, microservices is just an evolution of the architectures. And I would like just to, stay to, to, to talk about architectures for like one minute. Because when we try to define what is a good architecture, in my point of view, a good architectures have very little to do with nice diagram, nicely tightly banded context, good isolation, standardized technologies. This is nice. You probably want it or at least need it. But this is not a good architecture. For me, a good architecture is basically something that you can evolve over time. Why? Because your requirement will evolve over time. You will get new features, you will get new challenges every day. Your business, your company will evolve over time, and you will need to evolve because the world evolves. And if, you, if you're not able to basically evolve with your business, with the world, if you cannot evolve, you will probably die. So when I'm trying to define what is a good architecture, I'm always trying to look for something that could evolve over time. That's a very important requirement for anything. But let's come back to microservices. For most people, microservices is actually all about autonomy, 
meaning that you will get multiple services, multiple process working together, and you want them to be completely independent from each other. You want to be able to independently develop it, develop them, maintain them, deploy them, have a different complete release cycle, etc., etc. So you want this independence. And this is actually where you get most of the values of microservices in this autonomy, in this independence, because this characteristics, these features of independence, allows you to do one good thing. It allows you to scale, actually. And when I say scaling, it's not really about technical scaling, like having multiple machines, multiple process, because you can scale a monolith applications. And some companies like Facebook, like uh, Etsy, proved us that you can scale a monolith applications. They have done that for years, and they have done that quite successfully. But something that is really hard to scale and creates a lot of issues with monolith architectures is that it's really hard to scale in terms of people. Because your, because your company will grow, you will have more people working on a project, you will have more people basically trying to get one single job done efficiently. And doing that in a monolith architecture, in a monolith application, is extremely hard to do it well. And that's where microservices come. Like it, it's a new, a new strategy to have multiple people working together efficiently to get one single job done efficiently. So when I say scaling, it's mostly scaling in terms of people working in your company, working in your projects. And if you think about it, you know, if we go one step back and think about microservices and, and applications in general, every company by nature and inevitably will always be composed of a set of applications. And all of these applications we need to work together, at least at some kind of degrees, just for example, for the data. So even if you don't want to do microservices, even if you don't want to have multiple applications to maintain, if you, even if you want an, a big monolith architecture, you will still have multiple applications that need to work together. Even if you don't want that, it's just the reality. If you go to every company and look at the state of this company, it will always be a set of applications. And when we think about these applications, we think about features, we think about behaviors, we think about UI and how they should behave, but data and how they should interconnect tend to be an aftershock, meaning that we first decide what they should do, and then we'll get the data somehow. We'll find a way with FTP, with messaging, let's do the application first. So this microservices pattern is really just a very nice way to try to reimagine how we can have multiple teams working together to get one single job done. And this basically pattern is mostly focused on this concept of autonomy, of independence. But this independence actually comes with a cost. And this is quite intuitive if you think about it. Let's just say that we got a very simple application. And in this application, we just got two objects. We get an order object and a statement object, and they need to work together. Let's say they just need to share orders. So in this object orders, inside the object, we got all the orders. You know, we got data inside the object. And the statement needs to access the open orders. So what we learn at school, you know, when, while learning object-oriented programming model, we all learn that we should create some kind of interface, like a method to expose the data. So we can create a function like get open orders to retrieve the orders. And we do that, actually, we do that to encapsulate the data. We don't want this object, the statement object, to access directly the data inside the order object. And we do that to have loose coupling between this object. Because this loose coupling protects us from future change, meaning that we can change this order object. And as long as this interface, get open orders, is respected, we know that these two objects will work well together. So this encapsulation here is really in critical to have this loose coupling and to protect us from future change. So we got these applications. And let's say we want to have a new features, like we have some new requirements, we need to do some change. Well, in a monolith application, this is easy. You want to do a change, well, you do it. So for example, you change your two objects, you do the first change, you do the second change. Maybe for these new features, you need to change the data. Well, you just got one database. So you can just change this database, and that's done. You redeploy your application, do the change to your database, and that's it. 
you got your new features running in productions. But in a microservices architecture, this could be slightly different. Why? Because these two objects could be completely independently deployable. Maybe they are in two different services. And maybe for this new statement services to work, we need first these new order services, meaning that we need first to deploy these order services, then we need to deploy these statement services, meaning that we need to basically coordinate or synchronize their release cycle. And if we just have two services like that, it's quite easy. I mean, anyone can do it. But if you've got 20 or 30 services to synchronize all together, it could become an issue, and it would be at least very, very painful, and it would kind of break this notion of independence, because we want to be independent, but now we need to synchronize all of them together. And this is due because services, in a general way, work the best when they got a very nice and tightly bounded context. And a good example of tightly bounded context is the SSO, the single sign-on interface. Because if you got some kind of SSO interface, so you got the services just to do authentication and authorization, the interface is very obvious. You just need to authenticate and authorize, basically. But this interface is very unlikely to change in the future. So as your business evolves, as you got new features to implement, this interface well, is very likely to stay the same, meaning that you can develop this interface, this service, completely independently from the rest of the one. There's no coupling between these services and the rest of the business services. And this is due because SSO has a very tightly bounded context. So this is a perfect services. That's a very good example of good services. But the problem is that the service that we do develop every day at works tend to be very different because we do develop business services. We don't develop SSO every day. And if you just think about the data that need to be manipulated by these services, it is interconnected by nature. So let's say that, for example, you're a retailer company. You know, you like eBay, Amazon, uh, or, or Fnac, or whatsoever. You will have multiple data sets. Like you will have your catalog data set, you will have orders, customers, and it's very likely that most services we need to manipulate these data sets. It's very likely that most services in a retailer company, we need to access the catalog, the orders, and maybe the stock. And it's very likely that multiple services, we need to basically write and read this, uh, this data set. So on one side, we want them to be isolated, but just by the data, they are interconnected. So we are not like SSO, which is within this little, tightly bounded context, you know, on a small island and can do whatever you want. Your business services are, by nature, very well interconnected. And their futures are actually even more intertwined, interconnected together. So that's kind of an issue. Because on one side, we want this independence. We want this autonomy. Because that's where we get the value of microservices. That's how we scale. We want to be independent. But on the other side, when we think about data, we still want to be able to manipulate the data like we are used to do in the monolith applications. Like we want to be able to do aggregations, updates, insert new data. We got, basically, we want to manipulate this shared data set, like any kind of other data set. And normally, we do that with data systems, you know, with databases, for example. But this data system have actually very little to do with encapsulation. We try to encapsulate this data within services, but this system is actually the opposite of encapsulations. A database, for example, is actually an amplifying interface. So we are trying to develop these services that have data on the inside, some interface, and we just basically publish a subset of this data to the outside. You know, we just publish the result of this interface. But a database doesn't want just to publish a subset of the data. A database will magnify your data. You know, it will transform the data. It will aggregate your data. The data could have plenty of very magnificent shape. The database can basically do whatever you want for it. So it's really an amplifying interface. And that's where we get some kind of dichotomy. On one side, when we are speaking about microservices, we want to hide, encapsulate the data to have autonomy, to have independence, to be able to scale. But on the other side, this database, these data systems, they don't want 
to, and they have not been designed to hide the data. They have been designed to broadcast the data to as much possible, as much people as possible. So on one side, this data system is really all about exposing the data, and the services is all about hiding it. And they need to work together somehow, because we need to store our data somewhere. We don't have a choice. We need a data system at some point. So some people decide to share databases. But something that is critical is microservices shouldn't share a database. Just by curiosity, who heard of this advice that we shouldn't share a database? Ah, a good majority. Well, almost everyone. Good. That's a good advice. And that's yeah, that's a very good advice, trust me. And that's kind of intuitive, actually. Because as soon as multiple services share a database, it kind of creates the highest kind of copying you could do between these services. Because what is a database? A database has data, it has a representation of this data, but this data is actually mutable. So you just got a mutable state that has been shared between services. So basically you got shared mutable state, something that we try to get rid for years in computer science, and now you got one between two services. So basically they will be very tightly coupled together. And if you are in these situations where two services need, need to share a database, you should consider just having one service. Maybe you don't need two services there, maybe it doesn't make sense at all. So microservices shouldn't share a database, that's true. So what can we do instead? Okay, we, we need our data, we need to share our data, what can we do? Well, people and basically teams tend to do two things. The first thing that most people do is that they tend to wrap a database or a data system within a services. So basically they create some kind of data services with a database wrap up inside. And to be honest, this is okay and it, it will work, but it will work only at some scale. When you will reach a certain scale, one of these two things is very likely to happen next. And it's not a good thing, trust me. The first one is that you will start your data service. And at first, it would be neat, it would be clean, it would be nice, but every day, every week, every year, you get new requirements. You will need to expand this interface because you get new services, services evolve, and they need the data. So you will need to expand these data services. So basically, the, the function, the method that you will have will have longer and longer names. They will take more and more arguments, and they will become basically bigger and bigger. And most people, what they do is that they just create a lot of functions. For example, you can start with just get orders, and then get open orders, get all orders, get orders unfulfilled, etc., etc. And I'm pretty sure that it will resonate with a few of you, but this kind of services, after two years of existence, it just looks like a big mess. You know, it's like a big collection of functions, which one you don't know which one is used or not, that you don't know if they are working, and it's really hard to maintain. And when you get these big services, like these big jumbo chunk services, you will notice that you really have tight coupling between these services and other services. Like, everyone will say, oh, could you please update this service? Oh, please, I need that for these new requirements. Please do it. Basically, you, you will have dependencies, again, between services. And why do you have these dependencies? It's actually because you're building a shared database here. By wrapping up and developing a lot of interface on top of your database, you're just building your own cookie database on your own with your own languages. And that's the end result of most of these services after like two or three years of existence. And the more data you have, the more it will amplify this issue, unfortunately. Here data will not help us at all. So these data services are nice, but they just work until some scale. And the second thing that is very likely to happen next is just that some teams, some services, just give up and decide to copy the whole data set. You know, because we are developers, and we are very good at one thing, is meeting deadlines. So if we need to be in production by December, we will be in production by December. And if these data services has other priorities, if the release cycle is not aligned, well, we will find a way. We, will, we are very good at finding a way. We always find the solutions. And sometimes the solution is, okay, you cannot implement these features. Well, I will just get all the data, copy it locally, and use my local copy of the data to do whatever I want. So I've seen frequently people doing that. It's just like one team giving up, getting all the data, and that's it. You're basically copying data set. But this approach leads to a new, a new kind of problem, and it's very problematic. 
And every time I've been with customers, it turns to be big companies, I cannot hide that to you, all of them have been impacted by these issues. That's what I call data erosions, because it's, it's kind of like a funny name. Because at the end, you got multiple copies of the data in different locations. And this copy of the data will all mutate in place. They will all evolve locally. And the end result is that they diverge, meaning that service one does not have the same view of the data as service two, as service three, etc., etc. And that's a real problem for a lot of companies. Almost all of them has been impacted by this data divergence. They got multiple applications, and their data is not well synchronized between these applications. And that's a very big pain. And the more multiple copy, copies you have, the more likely your data will diverge to be true. And that's very painful, trust me. You don't want to be in these situations. And these data services basically kind of bring you to, the, to this cycle of inadequacy, meaning that you will always start on the left here with some nice and neat, clean services that you're really proud of, like, yeah, we did it, it works well. But then at some point, you will need to evolve it. Like, you know, you will get new features, new requirements, whatsoever. And you basically have two choices. Either to expand, increment these data services, but you will do that until you build a shared database, and then you got the same issues as a shared database. And the other path is basically you start copying data to every services. And if you start copying data to, to every services, you will get this data divergence issue. And this cycle is actually natural. It's not something that is weird or due to the technologies. It's because we got multiple forces here working or competing against each other. On one side, we want our services to be independent. We want this notion of autonomy. That's critical, this autonomy, because that's how we, we scale. That's the benefits of microservices. But on the other side, we got shared data set, but we want to be able to use this data like we are used to. We want our data to be accessible, basically. We want to group by, we want to update data like, like easily. And on the other side, even if we got this loose coupling and we want to access data, we don't want our data to diverge. Inconsistency could be acceptable in a few use cases. Some companies say, yes, I accept eventual consistency or inconsistency. For most people, and for business critical operations, consistency and divergence is very important. So we got these forces and we got all of these issues with data services. So is there a better way? Like, can we do some things better than just data services or shared database? And of course, the, the, the response is yes, we can always do something better. And the natural approach, and many speakers discuss about these, uh, these kind of architectures, is to do event-driven architectures. Meaning, instead of working with data, with schema, we will work with events, and we manipulate only events and facts. And I will not discuss too much about EDA, just because many people discuss about it in this conference, and there's like plenty of resources online. You know, it's not something new. EDA has been there for like years, and a lot of years. But quickly, you know, it's kind of the opposite of request-driven architectures. Basically, in request-driven, you get a request, and you get some kind of master services saying, do that, do that, do that, get me this data, blah, 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 blah. But the problem is that if you do that, it really creates some kind of strong coupling, because you're, you're commanding, you got something commanding other services. On the other side, with EDA, with even broadcasting, you got some kind of central bus of data, and anyone can submit events. So for example, the other services could say, this happened, and anyone, any services can subscribe to this event and say, okay, this happened, I will do this, or I will do this. And they will do whatever they want completely independently from each other. I like to say it's kind of like in your company, if you get a new hires, like a new employees, if the manager say payroll, please do that, uh, human resources, please do that, uh, security, please do that, it creates some kind of coupling because the managers need to be able to communicate with everyone. But on the other side, even broadca broadcasting or EDA will be the manager just sending an email to everyone saying, these people will join us in two weeks, please do the necessary. And anyone can subscribe to it and do whatever they want. Like human resources can get this email and say, okay, I need to do that. Payroll can get this email and do whatever they want, etc., etc. So that's exactly the same. So we need this central bus. We need to share basically events. And you need, most of the time, some kind of messaging system for that. But Kafka changed things a little bit. 
Because Apache Kafka is not, is not only a message bus. Apache Kafka is actually what we call a streaming platform. And this is actually very different from a message bus. And there are other uh, streaming platforms, but Apache Kafka tends to be the most mature one, and that's also the only one that I really know. So we discuss about Apache Kafka only. So what's the difference between Apache Kafka and some traditional messaging system like RabbitMQ or whatsoever? Well, we got, first of all, some technical or implementation difference, meaning that Kafka scaled very well. You could have petabyte of data in Apache Kafka, and that's literally true. We have customers having petabyte of data uh, in Apache Kafka. It's also very tolerant to fault. So, you know, if one machine goes boo and disappeared, it's very likely that your cluster will still be up and running. So it has some technical implementations difference, just you know, to, to adapt to these modern days of distributed systems. But it also has some fundamental or some features that are very different from uh, traditional messaging systems. For example, Kafka is actually persistent, meaning that all the events, all the facts that happen, they're not ephemeral. They will stay there. And the big advantage of having persistent data, persistent events, is that you can rewind and replay the data. And that looks very simple, like replaying data, but it opens a lot of new possibilities. Like, you have an issue, you have a new version of your application, and you can say, okay, actually I did a bug, I fixed a bug, now please replay all the messages for the last two months. So this ability to roll back and replay messages is critical and opens a lot of new possibilities. It also has a lot of advanced features like compacted log, which allows you to have a topic some kind of log that looks like a key value stores, and it has many advantages. We also support, for example, transactions, and transactions allows you to not care about idempotency. And idempotency is not hard, you know, everyone can do idempotency, but that's always a pain. And also, it's really easy to get it wrong, you know, it's really easy to do a mistake in your idempotence program, so it's quite nice to have it basically built in inside Apache Kafka. And if you think about it, it's a very nice place to keep the data on the outside, outside your services. Meaning that in your architectures, if you do EDA, you could have Apache Kafka in the middle, and you could have basically all the raw data. You, know, you can have all the data, but without schema, you can just have the raw events, the raw facts there. And all the services could just have some kind of cached local view in locally. That would not be the golden source of the data. You know, it's not the source of truth, your services. The source of truth would be this raw data inside Apache Kafka. And like I told you, Apache Kafka is not just a message bus. It's different. Apache Kafka is a streaming platform. And it means that at the centers of Apache Kafka, we indeed get this distributed log. So a log is kind of like a distributed, a distributed happen only an immutable file in the middle. So it basically got something where you can put data. And of course you can access this log with very simple clients. So you can have a producer just to push new messages, or you could have a consumer to read and subscribe or to replay the message. So you can interface with the log in a very simple way. But there is a whole ecosystem that we got connectors to basically interface Kafka with data system directly. So for example, you can say, I connect my DB2 mainframe to Apache Kafka just to get all the data with CDC or some other mechanism. And then I take this data and I will push it from Apache Kafka to Elasticsearch or to MongoDB. So this is a very nice way this connector to connect services together. But the real change, the real advantage of Apache Kafka is here in the bottom, is this streaming engine. So this streaming engine is basically a way to manipulate data and that's a core difference between traditional messaging systems. So a streaming engine, I like to think about it kind of like a machine. So you get all the data that comes in, all the data that will come as the input. And in this streaming engine, it's a machine that will take this data, manipulate it, for example, join it, aggregate it, and you will get data on the output. So with this streaming engine, you can do stuff like join or filtering of your data or aggregations like group by. And if it sounds like SQL, because join, group by, filtering is kind of like SQL if you think about it. Well, it's normal because we're doing here data manipulation and SQL is also there to do data manipulation. And basically this streaming engine allows you to manipulate the data, to slice and dice the data like you are used to. Meaning that 
in your architectures, you could have Kafka with all the raw data. Now, in Kafka, you just got the events in a shape that is not dedicated or specific to any services. You just got the raw facts, the raw events in Apache Kafka. And every service can subscribe to it and consume the data. But this data in Apache Kafka, in this raw schema, is probably not adapted to your services. Because your services will need specific data. Maybe you need some kind of consolidated, aggregated view. Maybe you just need a subset of your data. And you can actually use this streaming engine to manipulate the data like you are used to. So if you just need a subset, or if you just need a counters, you can use this streaming engine to manipulate the data in your services automatically. And if we think about it, I said stuff like join, like group by, like aggregations. But this is not easy to do. And to do that, a group by, a join, you actually need a state. And this is true that our streaming engine is not just a, uh, just a streaming engine, that's what we call a stateful streaming engine, meaning that in your pack and automatically, this API will keep some kind of local view of the data in your services. So for example, if in Apache Kafka, we got one topic and one compacted topic, so one log and one compacted log, what will happen in your back is that this library, if you want to do a join, we create some kind of local cache of this data locally in your services. So they will basically get all the data and we store it somewhere in some kind of persistent data stores. And by default, at least in Apache Kafka, this persistent data stores is a Rocks DB interface that is persistent. So in your back, you don't know it, but you already got a cache of this data. So you already got all the data locally. And how can you use this data? You know, you got this streaming engine doing data manipulations, but how can you consume this, the output? Well, basically, you got two choices. The first one, and that turned to be uh, the most natural and the easiest, most intuitive choices, is just do your computations locally. For example, you can take the orders, the stock topic, do a join, and you can push back the results to Apache Kafka. And then anyone can basically consume these results, like any topics. Because at the end, the result is just a topic like anything else. But the other way of consuming the data is even more interesting. Because we got this local cache inside your services. So this cache will be maintained by this API automatically. So you can do your streaming. Like for example, you can consume two, to two, two topics, join it, push it back to Apache Kafka. But instead of getting the data from Apache Kafka, we got an API to interface with this local cache. And this local cache is actually a key value store that is both on disk and in memory. And you can use basically your local built-in key value stores to get the data outside of Kafka from your services directly. So basically, you kind of get some kind of embedded key value store or embedded query engine right away. So, we got a shared storage with Apache Kafka in the middle and with this distributed log. And now we got this kind of query engine that allows us to manipulate the data, you know, like slice and dice the data, filter it, aggregate it, and basically shape the data to your need. But if we just take one step back and try to think about it, isn't data storage plus query engine the exact definitions of a database, you know, the things that we don't really want. And is Kafka a database anyway? It kind of looks weird. And on top of that, we are discussing about microservices. So it's very likely that we don't have just one services, but multiple services and multiple queries all running together. So we got one shared storage and multiple queries that will be shared across um, multiple services. Isn't that a shared database, you know, the things that we wanted to not use at all at the beginning of this talk? Well, there is a major difference, because this is not a shared database. Because the big difference is that this streaming engine is not centralized. You know, it's not executed by Apache Kafka. This streaming engine is just an API that runs locally in each services. And this creates some kind of major difference. That's what we like to call a database inside out. Because most databases, basically, internally, they work with a log, with the transactions, with a redo log, and then they expose the data and query to the people. But here, we do 
the opposite. We have this transaction log, this log has a, has a centers. We got these historical streams really at the centers, and all of this data manipulation and all basically the data shape and data transformation is actually done by you. So it's exactly the opposite of a database. A database basically uses the log and hide it, and at the opposite here, we present the log to everyone, and this data manipulation is done by everyone independently. So microservices shouldn't share a database. And that's a very good advice. You know, you should definitely not share a database. But what we're building here isn't a normal database, not at, at all a database, actually. Because this data manipulation with this streaming engine allows you basically to decentralize the responsibility of query processing. Because each services completely independently will get the data and do the transformations they need basically to shape the data to their need. And something that is critical to understand is that in Kafka, the data is actually immutable. And this immutability is critical for coupling because each services can do whatever they want, but whatever they do, they cannot impact other services because they cannot change the fact that this event, that this message is in the central bus. So the core features in Apache Kafka in the log that allows us basically to create this independency, this loose coupling, is the immutability. If a service could change a fact, it would create some tight, some tight coupling right away. So in some kind of event development architectures, you can use Apache Kafka in the middle, you know, as a kind of distributed log. And this is really the golden copy of your data. So this is where this is the source of truth for the data. And this source of truth is composed of events, of fact, of basically some things that happen. And anyone can just subscribe to this source of truth, consume the data, and with this streaming engine, they can manipulate and shape the data to their need. And this streaming engine has many advantages. Like it will guarantee to you that you will do exactly once delivery to not care about item potency. Uh, if you have done some messaging, you know that exactly once is it's really hard, <laughs> literally really hard. And it will also support a lot of functions to easily manipulate the data. It will support stuff like data transformation or aggregation and state. So this streaming engine allows you to slice and dice the data like you are used to. And at the same time, it will allow you that you will consume and, cons and process every messages. So if you want to share a database, basically between services, the kind of trick to do it, you know, to do event development architectures, is to sh turn it inside out, to not work with mutable state, but to work with this immutable transaction log. That's really the trick of ensuring that you will not have coupling between services, to work with immutability. So if we try to do a quick recap of what we discussed so far. So let's take our three forces. You know, this autonomy, this ease of change, uh, the fact that the data need to be accessible, like we need to be able to group by, manipulate, filter data like we are used to, and we don't want data to diverge. If you use a shared database between services, you will not really have autonomy because basically it will create right away some kind of tight coupling between your services. But on the other side, your data will be very accessible because you can manipulate the data like you're used to, basically in SQL or something else. And it's very unlikely that you will diverge because you got, got just one copy of your data, so it's very unlikely to diverge. You just, you just got one source of truth. But if you use a data service interface, your services will still be coupled. At least your services will be coupled at, at least with this data services interface. So you get slightly more autonomy because you get this interface, but it's not perfect. But you still have some coupling between services, which make it harder to schedule and release and to be completely independent. And data will be slightly less accessible because every time you will need to do uh, a change Basically, you, you will need to develop this service, these data services. So basically, now you need to synchronize two release cycles. But it's still very unlikely that you get divergence, uh, except if you copy the whole data set, like we discussed, of course. And if you use some kind of traditional event messaging system, like RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, or, or whatsoever, something that is ephemeral, you know, something that doesn't have persistence, this time, your services will be autonomous. It will be completely independent because Basically, you can do whatever you want. You just got an event and they do the processing. So that's great. But this traditional messaging system 
doesn't provide any way to keep this data or to manipulate this data. So it's up to everyone, to each team, to ensure that that data is in the proper state and that they will update some kind of local shared view of this data. So basically, it doesn't help you at all to discuss about this accessibility or data divergence. For example, let's say that you had a bug and you ignored a few messages. You cannot replace them, unfortunately. But with this some kind of distributed log with a streaming platform, basically you still have this autonomy because you just publish events. You're doing event-driven architectures. But this time, this streaming platform gives you utilities, gives you an API, for example, with Kafka Stream, to manipulate this data and shape it to your needs. And as you can manipulate the data, this is actually part of the API. So these APIs guarantees that you will basically manipulate the data properly and that you cannot do a mistake. Like all the question of item potency, of how to do aggregation, is taken care of by the API. And on top of that, you can replay messages. And this here is critical because you will do bugs. And I, I did a lot of bugs and I will do bugs in the future. People do mistakes, you know, it's just what we do. Uh, but when we have a mistake, we want to fix it by doing a patch or whatsoever. If you got some kind of persistent event and you use events as a source of truth, you can just fix your issues and just say, okay, I fixed it and I know that I had this issue for like the last two months. And so I will replay every message, all the events from the last two months to, to make it ensure that my data is in, is in sync. So this replayability is quite critical to ensure the data integrity. So just before jumping to questions, I just would like to give merits where merit is due. Uh, because actually this talk is actually a big rip off of one of my colleagues. So Ben Stopford is one of my colleagues uh, at Confluent and he did many articles and he wrote a book uh, about this data dichotomy actually. So if you're very interested by this kind of conceptual concept of dichotomy and data, I will highly invite you to read his book which is publicly uh, accessible. And another thing that you should definitely watch or read uh, if you're interested by data with microservices is Martin Klepman. Martin Klepman is a professor and he did many books and he did many talk about turning this database inside out. And it's kind of like the, the initial authors about this concept of having a distributed log in the middle. So I would invite you to, to read these two persons because that's very interesting and that's kind of like um, an in-depth version of this 45 minutes talk. So I really hope that it has been useful to you guys. Uh, I know that this is kind of conceptual, it's kind of fluffy, but it's actually very real. Like people do that, people do EDA, and people use Kafka or some streaming platform in the middle of the architectures. Um, if you are interested and want to have some real use case or discuss about your Apache Kafka deployment, just to let you know, we have like a small stand at Confluent. I will be there most of the day, and I will be really happy to reply to, uh, to your questions or to discuss about your architectures or whatsoever. Uh, so on this, I think we got three minutes left. Woo -hoo. Uh, <laughs> any kind of questions? I hope it was clear. <laughs> oh, so you're very far away. Hi. Hi. Uh, well, it will take time for sure. Uh, <laughs> if you want to replay petabyte of data, well, you will need resources. You know, there's no, there's no magic. If you need, I don't know, one second of CPU time per event, and you get two trillion of it, it will take time. Something to know is that this streaming platform, like any kind of streaming platform, Spark, Kafka, or something else, is scalable, meaning that you can have multiple process, multiple threads, processing in parallel. So if you really need to replay petabyte of data, this is stuff that happens in the field, where you just need a lot of resources, or you will need to wait a long time. But that's basically two options. There's no magical trick. You can always try to optimize, but at the end, you will need to process this petabyte of data. Make sense? But that's very scalable. Kafka Streams or Spark, well, we speak mostly about Kafka Streams because I know it, is very scalable. So if you want to have 20 machines doing the computation in parallel, you definitely can. Uh, good question. So the question was, if you have a lot of events to replay, can we do some kind of snapshot from time to time? Uh, and that's very interesting. Um, and it kind of depends on the output of what you want to do. But actually, this kind of snapshot that we have decided, uh, I will discuss mostly about this state. Because this is, you know, every Kafka streams, every time you do stateful streaming, you got this state that we need to keep up to date. Like if you do a join, if you do a group buy, 
we need to, to have this state. And rebuilding this state, this state store, is normally what takes time. So you know, if you want to say, well, I want to roll back like two months before and replay everything, or if you have one machine that crash and need to rebuild this state, the rebuilding of this state, of, of this basically persistent stores, is what takes time. And actually, it's actually built in inside the API that the persistency of these state stores will be snapshot inside Apache Kafka. So meaning that instead of rebuilding this state store from scratch, we'll just take it because we got a snapshot in Apache Kafka. Uh, so that's the first way, basically. It's kind of built in. These state stores is built in persistent. And the second thing to know is um, actually there's like plenty of options. That's very complicated. So probably you've never heard of it. But if you've got an issue on one machine and you don't want to rebuild these test stores, you don't want to have this snapshot, you want to have something up and ready be, be that, be that is able to catch up the workload, we, you can have what we call standby replica threads, meaning that you can have basically one machine having the test store, and if it crashes, you will have actually one machine that have exactly the same state store ready to use. So we don't have to rebuild it because basically it has been replicated and ready to use somewhere else. So we got a persistency enabled with snapshot, but you can also have standby replica, which is not enabled by default. You need to enable it. Make sense? OK. Any? Yeah? Oh, that's a very, very good question. So the question was, um, disk and storage is quite cheap nowadays, yet we have something that is continuously growing. So could it be an issue that we have some kind of indefinite growing systems? Uh, and the traditional response is yes. If you want to do infinite storage, you need to do a proper sizing. Like if you need one petabyte or 200 terabyte uh, per year, and you want to store everything for everything, for infinite, you need to provision this the storage for every year. But what most people want to do is they actually want either to forget the events after some kind of retention, or they just care about the latest value. Like, you know, if you've got a topic with orders, updates, after maybe two years, you don't care about all the, uh, all the updates, maybe you just care about the latest state of the update. And that's where basically compacted topics come in mind. So in Apache Kafka, I just discussed about Apache Kafka because that's the things I know you can uh, define a retention policy, meaning you can say, I will keep the data, but just for 30 days, just for two years, and this way it will automatically disappear after some point. So that could be a nice way to ensure that it's not infinitely growing, because you just have some finite times of data stored. And the second way is to have this compacted topic. The compacted topic I discussed about is basically a way to say, for each messages, I want to keep the data all forever, but after this threshold, I don't care about all the events, I just want the latest value for this key. So basically it kind of like looks between a mix of topics of log and a key value store. Because at some point you will lose whatever happened in the past, you will lose all the events, and we just keep the latest values for each key. Make sense? So no secret, it's that you need to define your retention policy, either by time or either by just keeping the latest values. <laughs> Any other questions? No, or oh, it's like, oh, stop, go away. OK, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to catch me up. And <laughs> I'm wishing you a good day. Cheers, bye-bye. <laughs>